theme for this year is go. And uh, somebody once said, expectancy is the breeding ground of miracles. If you have an expectation, uh, likely then something great's going to happen. Low expectation, not much happens. But we want to go with a, just a great expectation that God's going to do something great. And I believe he has something good for you today. The title of our message is go build a church where everyone is welcome. Amen. I think that's a good idea, and that's central to Acts chapter 11, where we are today. So would you say with me this morning, thank you, Lord, for the book of Acts. Now, you guys, you know Luke is the guy who wrote the book of Acts. There's a great cloud of witnesses, the Bible says, so he might be leaning over the banister of heaven and just listening to that. And so one more time, would you say, thank you, Lord, for the book of Acts. And Luke's going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope you're hungry for the word of God today because we're going to be, as I mentioned, in Acts 11. There was this fellow, he was a, a grumpy man, a grumpy husband, and uh, his wife asked what he would like for breakfast. And he says, well, I'd like one scrambled egg and I would have one egg fried. And so she makes his breakfast, serves him the breakfast, and he still looks grumpy. And she says, now, now what's the matter? And she said, well, he says to her, you, you fried the wrong egg. <laughs> now, how many of you know that guy is not hungry? I mean, if you're hungry, you don't care if it's scrambled, fried, poached, whatever. You're just glad to have an egg. And, uh, but he, he, was, he, was, he was complaining. And actually, uh, complaining is a sign that you're not very hungry. But when you're hungry for God's word, it's like, I just want to hear God's word. I'm hungry for your word. And so today, let's be hungry for your, God's word. Jesus said, blessed are those, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. So I'm hoping today that you're filled as we hunger for God's word. Acts chapter 11, did you find it in your Bible? If not, take a look for Acts chapter 11. On your phone, download the Coastal Church app. The notes are there. Also, the scriptures are there. I'm going to read Acts chapter 11. I'm going to read the first, at least to verse number 12. Let's get caught up. Last week, we had Rick Shimatero with us, that Italian who was on fire for God. How many of you heard of Rick last week, right? I mean, he was, it could be 20 below, and he'd still be sweating. He's just so, such a fiery preacher. So... Acts chapter 11, now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. They had received it because, as you know, Peter went up to Caesarea and he went to the centurion's home, Cornelius, and he'd shared the gospel with them. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him. The Jews there contended with him, saying, you went in to an uncircumcised man and ate with them. And Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet, led down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, No, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now, when this was done three times, all drawn up again into heaven, at that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. So Cornelius, the centurion, sent some guys to get Peter. Then the Spirit told me to go with them. Do you know the Holy Spirit will give you instructions on who you should go visit? He still does that today. So the Holy Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, the six brethren, he took six people with him, I think when Peter's being uh, you know, asked by others why he went. He was glad to have six people went with him. They accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. They entered the man's house. Remember that thought. We'll come back to house at the end of the message. Acts chapter 11, verse 9. Let me put that up on the screen here for you. It says, but... The voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has cleansed and pronounced clean, do not defile and profane by regarding or calling it common or unhallowed or unclean. God's doing something in Acts chapter 11, folks, that's huge. He was telling Peter, 
He was telling the church, up till now, the Jews have been God's select people. But now something's changing where everybody would be welcome to experience salvation. And so he says to them, do not call them profane. Don't call another race profane. Don't call another culture profane. Don't disrespect them. Rather, you are to welcome them. Never call them unclean. You know, if we would just take this one verse and apply it into our world today, I think there'd be a lot more people getting along. Because here, God challenges them that you're supposed to treat everybody as equal and welcome them. This is a big change. In, in the world, in the way they thought for years, the, hundreds of years, ever since Abraham, they knew they were God's chosen people, but God's doing something new here in the book of Acts. A lot takes place. There's a lot of activity in the book of Acts. There's a lot of going in the book of Acts. Let me put up a picture because I'll show you some of the things that are going on. Quick overview. You'll talk more about it in your life groups, but this is a map. Cornelius had lived in Caesarea. That's around here somewhere, right by the ocean. That's where Peter had gone to visit Cornelius. Now, near the end of the chapter, the shift in the church goes from Jerusalem being kind of headquarters for the church to Antioch becomes the headquarters of the church. Antioch, you guys, that was a world-class city at the time. The number one city was Rome, number two was Alexandria, and number three was a city called Antioch. Antioch had about 600,000 people. Vancouver proper, about the same size. They got about 600,000 people in Antioch. It's a heathen town, if you like. A lot of Jews have been dispersed. When Saul started this persecution, a lot of them ended up in Antioch. They say maybe 10, up to 25% of the population were Jewish background, so a lot of people were there. And in Antioch, uh, Barnabas heads up there. So he goes up to Antioch, and then others are coming into Antioch. People come from Cyrene. People come from Cyprus to Antioch. Believers come there. We read about that later on in the chapter. They arrive there, and they go to work sharing their faith with others. And it's quite something. We don't know their names. It just says they came from Cyrene, which is today Libya, from Cy Cyprus, and they went to Antioch, and they went into the city, and they shared their faith which is, I think it's amazing. We don't know who they are, but they went about sharing their faith. The persecution that Saul had started had scattered people. And with the scattering, it was like seeds blown into the wind. The gospel went to all these different places, and a lot of them went to cities. It's noteworthy that they went to cities because that's where influence is, that's where culture is, and people ended up there. In our world today, there's... You know, a lot of people end up working in different parts of the world. I think of a lot of our, our Filipino friends. They've maybe left the Philippines and then work in different parts of the world. And such was the story of one couple that came to our church a number of years ago. They'd always sit over here on this side. And uh, they, they, they were well, he was well known, especially in the movie industry. And his name was Stephen Baldwin. So Stephen would come. This is about 2001. And he, he'd always sit over here on this side of the church. He was shooting a movie at that time. And you can, you can watch his story on Vimeo, I Am Second. He tells part of the story there. But we would get to know him. I guess his daughter, Haley, would have come with him at that time to church. Today, she's well known for marrying Justin Bieber. So now you know <laughs> more details. But anyhow, they used to sit over there. And he had become a Christian. And so how did... How did Stephen Baldwin become a Christian? Because he, he has certainly his past was, was not Christ-like. So, uh, but he tells a story that one of his house workers was in, always singing songs about Jesus. And uh, so one day he went up to her and he said to her, the only songs you sing are about Jesus. I'm just wondering, might there be another song in your repertoire that's not about Jesus? And she's, no, that's all, he's, all, all the songs I know are about Jesus. And it kind of bothered him. And then his wife came up to me. He was talking to his wife about this. And, and she said, well, actually, a housekeeper told us that she believes we're both going to become Christians and we're going to start a ministry. To which he said, really? And so, but he said, that was the starting point of our journey. And of course, the rest is history. They did become Christians. His movie career changed, and he became a follower of Christ. 
Because one person in his house began to sing about Jesus and talk about the Lord. And these people were scattered, and they were bringing Jesus into the homes of people in Antioch. You never know where you end up, but you can bring Jesus with you and share with other people. Uh, what else is happening? Barnabas, he's here now. He goes over to Tarsus. That's where Saul's from. Tarsus had, Saul had gone back to Tarsus, so then he brings him back to Antioch. Then later on, they leave Antioch. There's a famine coming. They hear that from a prophet. And so they take an offering up in Antioch, and they bring it back to the mother church in Jerusalem, the first record of an offering being received that we read of. So they come back there. And then they come back from Jerusalem, Paul or Saul and Barnabas and John Mark, and they'll end up coming back to, to Antioch. And then in Antioch, now there's lots of going, and they end up going and they end up going back to Cyprus, to Salamis, and, and the gospel keeps going. So there's a lot of going. I put that map up there to show you. In the book of Acts, there's a lot of going. What's happening in the book of Acts here is a reversal of Genesis chapter 11. In Genesis chapter 11, you have the story of the Tower of Babel. How many remember that story? Okay, so if you don't remember that story, go back, read Genesis chapter 11 this week. It's an interesting story. It's a story where men said, let's build a tower to ourselves, make a name for ourselves. And God comes down and he says, you know what? Uh, I'm going to scatter you because you are ending up doing something to worship yourself. You're putting yourself first instead of me. And so he scatters them and he gives them different languages. Up to that point, they had one language. But from there on, became different languages and tongues. And there's a great reversal in the book of Acts because in Genesis, they all came together to save themselves. It was all about them and their name. But in Acts, they came together to receive salvation. In Genesis, the tongues are supernaturally confused. The word Babel is where we get the word babbling from, which means, this uncon which means confused language. And so... They, their language is confused. And then in the book of Acts, the tongues are supernaturally understood. Remember on the day of Pentecost, even the gift of tongues, when you pray in tongues, if we all sing in tongues together to God, it's one language. It's really a supernatural sign of languages coming together. In Genesis, the world is scattered to the four corners. But in Acts, the church is commissioned to go to the four corners with this message in Genesis, there's division and disunity, whereas in Acts, there's unity and reconciliation. In Genesis, there's an agenda without God, but when you come to Acts, there's an agenda with God for our participation. So there's something happening in the book of Acts. Now, God, in his timeline, he's bringing all humanity together, and he's saying everyone is welcome to be a son or daughter of God. And I want you to go to all the nations and invite them to come in. So when Peter had gone up to now, they thought, no, it's just for us. But they said, wait a minute. They received the Holy Spirit just like we did. They were magnifying God. They were speaking in other tongues. So they got what we got. Who are we to say they can't be one of us? And so in humility, the other disciples said, obviously it's meant to be. And so they can be part of the church. This is the headwaters of the early church. We need to understand this as we grow our church. So God's purpose in salvation is to bring the races back together. And that happened, of course, as we see here in the book of Acts. And secondly, God's end in mind is that every tribe, every language will come together. If we go to the end of the book, if we go to the book of Revelation, say, what does it look like at the end? What will it be like in heaven? Let me give you Revelation 7, 9 to 10, where we read, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, would you say that with me this morning? Every nation, all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
This is the end. In Genesis, it was, hey, let's make a name for ourselves. But at the end of the day, all tribes, all languages are gathered together and we're worshiping the Lamb. We're shouting, we're shouting praises to God. So this is the end that God has in mind. And of course, as the church grows, it's meant to be a place where every culture, every language is to be welcomed. And, and the book of Acts, there's a lot of examples of this happening. In Acts chapter 16, we'll get there in a couple of weeks, but just to point it out, there are three people saved in Acts chapter 16. Lydia gets saved. Lydia? Ladies, you would like to meet Lydia. Lydia would have owned a shop here on Alberni Street, right by Burberry and Rolex, okay? Right across from Gucci, because that's the kind of product she sold. She was a seller of purple. That means a high-end women's clothing store. And she gives her life to Christ. She invites her whole family. And everybody in Lydia's household gets saved. So a woman gets saved. Then in Acts chapter 16, a slave gets saved. Then in Acts chapter 16, a Roman jailer gets saved, a Gentile. So you have a woman, a slave, a Gentile. Jewish men at the time, they would pray in the morning this prayer. Lord, thank you that I'm not a woman. Thank you that I'm not a slave. And thank you that I'm not a Gentile. See what God was doing? God was saying, no, no, no. Everyone is welcome. And Paul, when we would write to the Ephesians, I think he had this in mind when he writes this in Galatians, I should say, Galatians chapter 3. We are no longer Jews or Greeks or slaves or freemen or merely men or women, but we are all the same. We are Christians. We're Christians. They were first called Christians at that town in Antioch. Now, by the way, guys, it wasn't the Jews who were calling them a Christians, uh, it wasn't the, the friendly Jews, at least, and it wasn't uh, the believers themselves. It was a people that were wanting, it started off actually as a slur. It's only used two other times, the word Christian in the, in the Bible. And both times, it was a bit, of a, a bit of a dig, but it stuck. They said, oh, they're the, they're the Christians. And so we are Christ followers, and it stuck after that. We became, we're the Christians. We're all one in Christ, no matter Free or slave or male or female, it's for everybody. Acts chapter 13. Uh, Luke does something interesting. He lists five church leaders. He lists Saul and Barnabas. They're Hellenistic Jews, Greek culture, background. Simeon, nicknamed Niger, which means black because he came from sub-Saharan Africa. Lucius of Cyrene, modern-day Libya. And Manon, who was a friend of Herod the Tetrarch, which means that he was Jewish aristocracy. And so he lists these five people. Luke isn't mentioning them just to say, here are these five people, because three of them we never hear of again. What Luke's doing, now catch this, what he's doing is he's saying the early church had diversity. They had other nations, they had other cultures. This is what God has in mind. Three of them we never hear of again. One was from Asia, one was from Africa, one was from Mediterranean. He said, it's different parts of the world that are coming together to form the leadership of the church. There's integration happening. When I, when I look at our church today, I, and I'm so thankful that God has given us a, a church of many nationalities. If we go around the room this morning, I, I don't know how many we'd have here. Maybe just in this room alone, 40, 50 when you look at your pastors, you have Pastor Chris, you guys in the North Shore there, uh, Pastor Chris from Rwanda, okay? And you have, in, uh, you have David over there at, uh, at, at our commercial campus, and he's from Ecuador. And, uh, and Pastor Karen's over there this morning as well. She's from Venezuela. And then, then we have uh, Pastor Fari, he's from Iran, and Payam's from Iran. And then we have... Uh, uh, Pastor Brian from UK, from Europe, uh, and then we have uh, Pastor James from, from Malaysia, from Asia. You guys, this is a gift. Can you say thank you, Jesus? This is a gift. We have this diversity. This is not normal. I love it. And, and then you have, you know, then you have David from Alberta. <laughs> you got Cheryl from Saskatchewan. Yeah, Saskatchewan. We used to live in Swift Current, Saskatchewan. 
Saskatchewan means swift current. So we lived in swift current, swift current. Yeah, you know. Reminds me of this guy. He's a, he arrives at the airport at YVR, and he's from Texas. And he, he likes his boots, Texas like their boots. And he's waiting there by the carousel for his luggage. And he looks across, and he sees this couple standing there, and they're wearing mucklucks. How many know what mucklucks are? Okay, so for the rest of you, you can Google it. When you come home, you're a true Canadian when you know what mucklucks are. So you have to look up mucklucks. So he's standing there, and he looks at his wife and says, you know, those are very interesting boots. I, I wonder what kind of boots those are. And she says, well, you should go over there and ask them where they're from. He says, I, I think I'll do that. And so his outgoing Texas personality walks over and says, excuse me, I couldn't help but notice your, your very interesting boots. And I'm wondering where you're from. And they said to him, well, we're from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And he looks at them, and he walks back to his wife, and his wife says, well, uh, what are they? Where are they from? And she says, I don't know. They don't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, that's not in the notes. Come on, Coop, get back online. Here we go. Our primary identity is in Christ. You might have been born in Saskatchewan. You might have been born in Alberta. You might have been born in Malaysia. Your forefathers might have come from another country. Maybe you were born in Canada, but your forefathers came from another land, or maybe your First Nations, and you came from a particular tribe here. So that's your first identity. Your second identity is that you're Canadian. And then your third identity is that you're a Christian. And what united the church was they elevated this third identity. They, they said, no, this is number one. It's more important than the country I was born in, where I came from. And, and, and you're every, every, every tribe, every language, every race has things that, that they are known for and makes them wonderful. But the most wonderful thing about me is that I'm, I'm in Christ. And it's wonderful to be in Canada. And there's times that we do get united in Canada. Right now, there seems to be a lot of divisions and splintering. I, I'm hoping that the Canucks win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> I, I am. I'm trying to make something spiritual out of this, so bear with me. <laughs> now, if Edmonton wins, I'd be happy too. I'd, oh, yeah. <laughs> but stay with me, Jenny. I've got a point here, you know. <laughs> so, if, if it be Edmonton, so be it. But my point is this. I, I think if we have a Canadian team that can go to the Stanley Cup, you know what's going to happen for a couple of weeks? All the Canadians will be on the same page. And we'll all be smiling. We'll be waving. We'll say, you know, let's say it is the Canucks. Let's be people of faith. We'll say, yeah, go Canucks. You know, we'll see a Canucks jersey on, go Canucks. And for a little while, we'll all be forgetting about all our little divisions, and we'll get together on the same page. I, I, I liked it during the Olympics when we won the Olympic gold. You know, that was fun. We were all on the same page. We actually had watch parties in the church, and, that was, and the neighbors came, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Unity is powerful. God's into unity. As a matter of fact, we don't create unity. Our job is to preserve unity. God created the unity. The Bible says that we are to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So the unity is already made. Unity comes from the word unit. The unit is already there. Our job is to preserve the unity. I have two brothers and two sisters, five of us in our family. And there may be times when... My brothers or sisters said, oh, but he's not my brother. He's somebody else's relative. But they can't say that. They have no choice because we are a unit. We're in a family together. No choice. We're brothers and sisters because we have the same mother and father. Likewise, we have no choice when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ. If, they're, if the heavenly father is their father and they've made Jesus Christ their Lord, then they're brothers and sisters. You know, when you get to heaven and your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, beside your name is not going to be your denomination. It's not going to be, oh, here's Dave Coop, Coastal Church. <laughs> here's, you know, uh, Joe, whatever, and he, and he was uh, a Mennonite. And here's somebody else, and they were a Baptist. And here's somebody. 
That's not going to be in heaven. It might be here, but in heaven, we're all one. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know what is very attractive to our world today? Is when Christians are unified. They don't understand why we don't get along. So the more we can work together for unity, the more honoring it is to our Father. Amen? And so we're to preserve unity. And that means every tribe, every tongue, every language coming together. And if there's people that you have a hard time with today, and, and, they're, and they're maybe in another church, or another, another part of the world, even another culture, we're going to spend eternity together. So I think we should today just be embracing and loving one another. Amen. Our identity, first of all, is in Christ. Look what John, Jesus said in John chapter 10. I'll put it on the screen for you. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, other than the Jews. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there will be how many flocks? One flock. When you get to heaven, there's not going to be 20,000 different flocks. No, there's going to be one flock. Jesus has one flock, and there's one shepherd. And so in the book of Acts, what's happening is he said, every tongue, every language, every tribe is welcome for one church family. Amen. Well, let me wrap up with a couple of keys on how we can live this out and be integrated. Number one, love others even as Jesus loves the world. John 3, 16, you know this verse. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone, would you say that with me this morning? Everyone, everyone. You know what everyone means in the Greek? Everyone. So, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It's for everyone. Acts chapter 11, we're doing a dive into Acts chapter 11. God's saying something. This is for everyone, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, everyone. We have to appreciate the differences of others. Different cultures have different ways of expressing things. It's not wrong. Give each other the benefit of the doubt. Learn from each other. Some cultures like it loud. Some like it quiet. Some like it cold. Some like it hot. Some like it in the pot two days old. You know, so there's different ways we like it. But we have to learn to appreciate the differences. You know what my, one of my biggest challenges as a pastor is? Trying to find a happy medium. But sometimes people say, you know what? I, I wish it was louder. I wish it was quieter. I wish it was older. I wish it was newer. And you know what? Honestly, as a pastoral team, one of the things we think a lot about is how do we find a happy medium so the most of us can come together and we can celebrate and worship Jesus together. And so, of course, we experienced that last night. Uh, and then, as I mentioned already, you have to elevate your heavenly citizenship. That's number one. Somebody once said, the gospel is not colorblind, but color engaging. I like that. We have to walk in humility and respect. In Acts eleven eighteen, they said, when they heard these things, they became silent. They glorified God, saying, then God has also granted the Gentiles repentance to life. And so they walked with humility and respect. If he, if he did that in Cornelius' house, then okay, then we welcome them, and so be it. We'll all be together in one. And the last point is, I think, we have to do something similar to what Peter did. Peter was asked, now catch this, by the Holy Spirit to go to somebody's house. Now, in a minute, we're going to have overtime, and there's something that the Holy Spirit will ask you to do. And I would... I would say everybody here in this room, everybody at Squamish, everybody at North Van, everybody watching online, the Holy Spirit will do the same thing to you. He'll ask you to go to somebody's house. Now, I'll put up a verse here out of Luke. This is what Jesus' instructions to the disciples back then. He says, but whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. So part of our going is God's going to ask you to go to somebody's house and bring peace there. If a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it'll return to you. In other words, if people say, I don't want anything to do with you, just go on. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Remain in the same house if they invite you in, eating and drinking such things as a gift for the labor is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. In other words, build a relationship there. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as they set before you and heal the sick there. Say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. 
I want to point something out to you, church. This is very important on how we share our faith according to a biblical model. The last thing is to say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. The last thing we do is really share how they can experience the kingdom of God. Why? Because first, they have to know that you care. How do they know that you care? Number one, here's the order. Go to their house. Number two, have a meal with them. Number three, listen. Where's their need? And then pray for that need that they can be healed. It could be a marriage. It could be a physical need. It could be a financial need. Pray that they're healed. And then say the kingdom of God has come near. Then introduce them really to Jesus. I grew up and we did it the other way around. I preach to you, Jesus. I pray that you can be healed. I maybe have a meal with you. And I maybe, maybe go to your house. The wisdom of Jesus in 1994, when we started our church, we couldn't figure out how do we reach people in a high-rise community. This was the answer. So I said to the people, do you think you can get invited into somebody's apartment? They say, I think we can do that. I might have to invite them over first, but I think I could get invited to somebody's apartment. Okay, that's the first step. Don't, don't, don't preach to them. No, 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 no. Don't pull the trigger on that. <laughs> all, you, all I want you to do is go to their apartment. Take a look around, visit them, care for them, then have a meal with them. Can you, can you do that? Can you have a meal with them? Yeah, I, I, I can have a meal with them. You may have to invite them for a meal first, but when they invite you for a meal, when you sit down with them, all you're doing is listening. And if they say, you know, I lost my job this week. I don't know what I'm going to do. At that point, all you do is just say, would you be okay if I prayed with you? Most people will not say no. Some will just say, well, whatever, sure, can't hurt, whatever. But then you pray, and you pray believing, amen? And then what's going to happen? God's going to heal it. And they'll come back, and then they'll say to you, um, you know, you, you prayed for my grandmother. She was in the hospital, or you prayed for my job, and you prayed for this or that, and it changed. Can you, can you just explain to me what you believe? Now you say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Do you see the pattern? So we're to go to people's homes, but Jesus here gave us a brilliant pattern, a method to show that we genuinely care about others. And then when the account comes, when people say, can you give an account of the hope that's in you? Then we must, we must give voice to it and share my hope is in Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And when we share that, the Holy Spirit does the rest. We don't have to save anybody. He does that. We just have to be his ambassadors. Amen? This is so much fun. Your, your happiest days, the greatest days of your life will be when you have the privilege of leading somebody to Jesus. I'd like to pray with you as I close this morning. Maybe you're here this morning, and, and you've never made that decision. Somebody invited you here. And maybe, you, maybe they came to your house and said, hey, why don't you come to church? And this is your moment. Maybe you're watching online today. There at Squamish or North Van, and God's tugging on your heart right now. He loves you. Maybe you thought, I'm not included. It's not for me, my people. It's for everybody. It's just a matter of saying, Lord, I welcome you into my life. You don't have to work to get right with God. That's been done through Jesus. It's a gift, a gift of righteousness that we need to receive. So would you pray with me this morning a very simple prayer, inviting the Lord into your life? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, this Sunday morning, I turn to you. Forgive me my sins. I accept what Jesus did when he died on the cross for my sins so that I could be right with God. I invite you, Lord, to come into my life. Amen.